also, uh, I was raised in a, a minister's family. Uh, my grandfather was a minister, and they produced other ministers, and uh, it was such a blessing to, to be raised how important Jesus was in Christmas. That's never been something that I had to deal with or forget. I've been reminded of that since I was old enough to know what was going on. The top priority in my world at Christmas time was Jesus every year. And I had so many wonderful Christmas. And, and we think about Christmas past. And the number one way we think about Christmas past is we think about Ebenezer Scrooge. And the ghost of Christmas past, right? Everybody read that or seen a movie or remember that? It's one of my favorite books. And one of my favorite uh, movies in three different ways that it's been done. But we remember great Christmas memories. And some of you may remember a meal from Christmas or it might be a gift. I remember a couple things for Christmas. I remember one year as a gift. I remember getting up and come out and... When I opened my gifts, there just wasn't as many gifts as usual. And you know, when you're a 12-year-old kid, that's a terrible feeling because you've got the guilt thinking, well, surely I'm not just sitting here thinking about how many gifts I'm going to get. But yes, I am thinking about all that. And I didn't get as much. And Dad had the weirdest look on his face the whole Christmas morning. And he said, well, they looked at me and Vicky, and they said, well, what did you think of your Christmas, kids? Well, it was awesome. It was wonderful. It was fantastic. And I'm lying through my teeth filled with doubt, wondering what had happened. Had I been a bad boy? What was going on? And Dad just had this glow. I couldn't figure out what in the world was wrong with him. You know, and he says, well, I'm glad your kids appreciate it. And she went, oh, Dan, I think somebody, I think Santa left you something else with what? Did you look behind the tree? Now, the tree was kind of tucked in the corner. And I didn't think about looking behind the tree. And I said, oh, okay. And so I got up and walked across the room and squeezed in, looked behind the tree, and there was my first set of golf clubs tucked in the corner. And now I knew why Dad had that glow on his face because it was time. He was going to let me start playing. And uh, they were just so beautiful and wonderful, and I still have them today. I won't let those go for anything. I don't use them because they're kind of quite antiquated. They actually had wood woods. And, um, but uh, it was just a wonderful memory how excited he was. And then, of course, every year after that, the first thing I did on Christmas morning was look behind the tree. <laughs> but it was an incredible memory. And then, and then you know, you go later and you have the memories that you have with your kids. Things you do with them. And, and I remember one year Nathan and Lucas were getting old enough to, to like basketball. And uh, I, I bought them uh, one of those really fancy basketball hoops that you has the thing that you put all the sand in and everything to keep it up and everything. And we hid it in Dad's garage. And at that point in time, we lived two and a half blocks from Mom and Dad. And we had the brilliant idea that on Christmas Eve, after the boys were asleep, we would wheel that down and put it in the driveway and put a great big red ribbon on it. Okay? Can you picture the scene? And I think that Christmas Eve night that it was about 37 or 38 degrees so it wouldn't freeze, but we got like two and a half inches of rain. <laughs> and Dad and I, you could have rinsed us both out. I mean, it was unreal as we dragged that thing. Remember how they had the wheels so you could move them? Well, that doesn't make it easy to move on concrete sidewalks for two and a half blocks. Plus, not how many sheriff's cars sit. Can I help you guys? <laughs> We're just robbing that family down the street, officer, if you got a trailer. <laughs> but anyway, it's a great memory. Kids remember getting up and they didn't want anything else to do with the rest of their toys. They wanted to go out and shoot hoops, and it was muddy. And, but those are great memories. We have incredible things that we remember. And, and that's wonderful. That's what God wants. He, he gives us the ability to remember. Jesus says with communion, do this often so you remember me. But do we remember the important thing about Christmas past? Do we remember... Just what God has done 
and what Christmas is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And before we go into God's Word, let's pray. God, we come to you today just so thankful for Christmas. It's an exciting season, and, and I know that it's uh, not something that you stress on in your Word. There's actually not a whole lot about it in the Bible. But it's such an exciting time for friends and families, and we enjoy it so much. And we have so much fun. But help us to remember what it truly is. And that if we're truly celebrating your birth, and we're celebrating what God has done, and put that in our hearts and our lives, so that everyone sees it. And so that we can change lives with your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We remember getting really excited about Christmas. Like I said, I, I truly love Christmas, and, and I start bouncing off the walls by the 23rd. I stay pretty calm till then, but on the 23rd, I'm rapping and making sure everything's cooked and, and, and getting everything excited in the house. And this year's been a little weird for me because I'm doing something I don't normally do. I, I've been listening for about two weeks to nothing but Christmas music. I mean, I've been listening to... Amy Grant, Daryl Hall, John Oates, and the Beach Boys, and Andy Williams, and Perry Como, and Julie Andrews, and Michael Bublé, and I mean, I've just been listening to Christmas music like you can't believe, and, and I, have it, I have that Spotify thing on my phone, and I've just been playing, trying all kinds of new Christmas albums, and enjoying it, and I'm, I'm getting all excited, and do you get that way about Christmas? Do you get excited? There's a lot of people that say they dread it. They don't get excited about Christmas. Have you ever met them? It, it, it can be really sad. Some of them say, well, you have to get with the family. You know? And then there's a lot of people Christmas shopping, and they're very hateful about it because they don't want to shop. And, and I'm always sure that the people who don't want to do any Christmas shopping are non-Christians. Because the Bible says if you don't want to give a gift, if you don't want to give a gift, don't give it. If it doesn't come from your heart with love, don't give it. It makes it easy because then everybody's happy on shopping. And the people who don't want to do it aren't there. But do you get excited about it? Do you like the wrapping paper and the lights? Do you like the cookies? Do you like, I like party cookies a lot. <laughs> and I really like those peanut butter cookies that have the chocolate kiss in it. Don't I get it? <laughs> I got a big bucket of them today to celebrate Katie's birthday. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I tell you, I just love all that stuff. Music, I, I don't even mind the cold as much. You know, last night, I have to tell you something I've learned in the hospital, something that Jules has never explained to me correctly. Every patient in the hospital keeps their room temperature somewhere around 96. <laughs> okay, and I look around and I see all of these nurses and they have sweatshirts under their scrubs and all these things and I'm like looking for a Speedo scrub. <laughs> Because it's just, it's just horrible. So you're in all these 90 degree rooms and they call me and they say, hey Dan, 22 is ready to go home. So what happens is I get a wheelchair, I pick up 22, I take them down the elevator, I wait for their ride, we go out to the car, and they're all bundled up and the people in the car are bundled up and I'm standing there in my speedo scrub. <laughs> And this lady looked at me last night, she said, oh, I feel terrible, you must be freezing. And I said, well, after a little time on the floor, it feels kind of nice out here. But you do, you see the Christmas lights and the Christmas trees, and it's just, it takes the edge off that cold from us, you know? Now, December 26th, for any of you people who are listening to this, I want 90 degrees again. But, <laughs> but we look at, look at Luke 1, 26-38. One month later, God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth of Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. And the angel greeted Mary and said, You are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was 
confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, don't be afraid. God is pleased with you. And you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of God Most High. The Lord God will make him king as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel forever and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am not married. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come down to you and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a son, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen as you have said. And the angel left her. An announcement from an angel, not just any angel, from the archangel Gabriel. Okay? We all know that the President of the United States has a press secretary who he sends out to make all the announcements of the things that are going on in the White House and the things that are going on in the government. Okay? And it's not a new thing. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Well, God has Gabriel. And when there's something big going to happen, he sends Gabriel to announce it. And the archangel Gabriel comes to this little girl in Bethlehem. This little teeny girl, I, I, the kids were amazed the other day, because in youth group we're watching, I always tell them that she's about 12 to 13. And there's a scholar that comes on and says that she was somewhere from 10 to 14. Okay? Mary was a very young woman. And, and here she is, and she's sitting there, and the archangel Gabriel comes and tells her these things. And there's four things we get. Number one is, Mary is blessed. And it's exciting, and it's incredible. We forget sometimes we're blessed. Because to us, we're blessed when everything is perfect. Oh, yeah? But you know what? We're blessed when things are bad. And yes, Mary just got told that she is going to give birth to the Son of God. Isn't that awesome news? But you know what? She's going to be a pregnant teen. She's not going to be married yet, and she doesn't have a clue what uh, Joseph's going to say when she tells him. Because you know, can you imagine? You're engaged to a beautiful young girl, and she comes in and says, I've been impregnated by God. You know? I want you to think how you look at somebody who tells you that God told them something the other day. What do you think? They've been praying for something from God. They've been reading the Bible like crazy. They're doing everything because they really need a message from God in their life and they come and tell you that they just heard something from God. How do you act? Uh, they're one of the fanatics. They're freaky. Right? Well, imagine that she comes and tells you that God made her pregnant. You know what happens to pregnant girls in those days? They get stoned or tossed out to live in the woods, a life of prostitution for the rest of their days. And this young girl that went into that situation doesn't fear any of that. She's blessed. And the reason that she's blessed is because the world is so excited that God's Son is coming. There's been 300 years of silence. They haven't heard anything from God. Now they know that God's Son is coming. What an exciting time. And Mary's the first to know. And she's just on fire. She can't wait for Christmas. She can't wait for nine months. Because Jesus is coming. We know that Jesus is coming. How excited are we? We know that He's going to return. <clears throat> we know that it's any day. The Bible tells us to get up each morning and pray, Jesus, please come soon. How many of us do that in each day? How many of us are truly that excited to be with Him forever? And Mary is. God's Son is coming. And she learns and remembers the thing that is the great Christmas message. Nothing 
is impossible with God. Not only do we see the fact that a virgin gave birth, we see that a star in the sky comes to show the exact location of what's going to happen. We see celestial beings come and tell lowly shepherds that the baby is born, the baby is here, the Messiah has come. Then we watch him grow into a perfect man who not only does incredible miracles, but dies a horrible death on a cross and raises from the dead. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And then we see the thing that, that touches us, that Mary is a faithful servant. Hearing all this stuff and in her excitement, Mary is a faithful servant. And that's one of the things we have to remember as we come into Christmas. Because as we get excited about Christmas, and it is an exciting time, we can forget Jesus, can't we? Isn't one of the tough things about Christmas to truly remember what it's about? When we're clipping coupons and you have to have this and this and this and this done. You know, the other day I'm thinking about my, my work weekend. Because this is my weekend to work at the hospital and think about all the things that's going on. And I get this little message from the hospital floor that I have to have two dozen cookies baked at the hospital today for a charity bake sale tomorrow. And my response was, you come to my house and bake me. Very Christian. Very godly. I'm putting Christ first in my Christmas. I got it done. I got it baked. But you know what? I'm a faithful servant. Not because I bake cookies. But I'm trying to be a faithful servant. I'm trying to remember that Jesus is first. And that that's what the season is. And to put that in my thoughts and hearts and forgiving when people are mean and nasty at the stores and trying to represent in the world what Jesus wants us to be. Because that is the reason that we're excited. You know, as we look back at Christmas past, one of the things we have to remember is Christmas is preparation. There's a lot of preparation that goes on in Christmas, isn't there? Christmas cookies. I've had some of, the, some of the ladies here at church give me these big round trays and there must be 25 to 30 different kinds of cookies. You know, that they baked and they made. And, and then there's the shopping and there's the cleaning and there's all the things to do to get ready for the kids. I finally became smart after so many people have told me maybe why. I got the kids together the other day and I said, I just want to let you know we had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I said, for Christmas Eve, or for Christmas dinner, for Christmas, on Christmas Eve, I'm driving to Dayton and buying eight large Marion's pizzas. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to warm them up. And they, they, they all glowed. Dad, Marion's, we love you so much. They were so excited and so on fire. And, and Sammy looks at me, the thoughtful, sensitive young man he is. He says, Dad, you just can't afford that. And I said, son, do you know how much two turkeys and a spiral ham and mashed potatoes and all that is? I'm going to save money on the deal. He said, then it's awesome! <laughs> but there's a lot of preparation that goes in. Sometimes you even screw up one year. It was so crazy, and I was putting so many years with hours with Kmart, and so many things were insane that we decided that we were going to, after the Christmas Eve service, wrap all the gifts. Not one gift was wrapped. And we sit down to wrap gifts at 12.15 a.m. and had three pieces of scotch tape. <laughs> How many of you remember Lawson's? Lawson's sold scotch tape. It was $7.50 a roll. And I think they jacked up the price on Christmas Eve. But they sold scotch tape. But we think about the cooking and the wrap. In Luke 2, 1, 7. About that time, Emperor Augustus gave orders for the names of all the people to be listed in the record books. These first records were made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to go to their hometown to be listed. So Joseph <coughs> and Levi 
the, oh, by the way, I gotta tell you this. Sometimes I rap the trail. You know, the book of Luke is a lie because there is no such thing as Cornelius. Did y'all know that? And then on 11 years ago, they were doing a big dig and they found an office when they went in an archeological dig and it was like a brass thing and they translated it and it said the office of Governor Corinius <laughs> of Syria. So anyway, I had to tell you that because it just makes me happy when the people who say the Bible is the truth get burnt. Um, everyone had to go to their hometown to be listed. So Joseph had to leave Nazareth and Galilee and go to Bethlehem and Judea. Long ago, Bethlehem had been King David's hometown and Joseph went there because he was from David's family. Mary was engaged to Joseph and traveled with him to Bethlehem. She was soon going to have a baby, and while they were there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She dressed him in baby clothes, laid him on a bed of hay, because there was no room for them at the end. I want you to think about the things that God did to get ready for this. First of all, the prophecies were that the baby would be born in Bethlehem, while the parents lived in Nazareth. How do you get him to Bethlehem? Oh, I know. I'll make the governor call for a census that they have to go there at the time. It had to be done. All the things are going to be that the baby is going to be born in humility and everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that there's so many people that go there that every motel is going to sign. So there's no room at the end. That's not coincidence, folks. That had been planned since day one of creation. It was all set up. They had to be in the barn. It had to be in Bethlehem, and there had to be no room at the end, and it had to be in the barn. The barn had to be open, and a place to go. All of this fulfills prophecy. So this wasn't just an event that just happened. It was an event that God planned. As we remember how much planning goes into our Christmas, and trying to make sure we, we get cards ready, and food ready, and gifts ready, and the lights out, and all the things that we do that are all the work. Think of all the things that God did. Place a star up for everybody to see. All the prophecies that were taken care of, the planning. So we remember the excitement, we remember the preparation, and most of all, we remember the day. We have so many memories of Christmas. We remember the events of Christmas. I can remember so many stories, and some of them good, and so many not good. Fortunately, Dad had cancer, and he wasn't allowed to be anywhere near any, any uh, germs. They were trying to keep him as far as germs as they could. And it's Christmas morning, and cell phones have just come out, and mom and dad are on their way up there. And the kids come out of their bedrooms, we're in Bellevue, and Nathan, Lucas, and Hannah, and Sammy get there, and we pass out the gifts, and I can't remember who was first. It was a turkey in the oven, and mom's car full of ham and stuff, and then on the road towards Bellevue, the first kid pukes. <laughs> all over the gifts and everything, and then all of a sudden, it was like a puking choir. <laughs> Four children. <laughs> and you know, as a parent, you're keeping it together with all the towels and napkins and Lysol. And then you're on the cell phone. Mom, Dad, we love you. You have to turn around. You can't come. And uh, they said, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to have Christmas on about the 28th. And we put the kids back in bed and cleaned up. Us and tried to do as much as we could with the food and put it away. And, but you want to know something? It sounds horrible, but now when kids talk about it, they laugh. And it's a great memory. You know what I mean? And, and the day of the year they had Christmas on the 28th, when everybody felt good, the fevers were going, everybody was healthy, and the house had been sufficiently Lysol to where Grandpa could. You know? And I have to tell you, it was some of the most turkey I've ever eaten. Because I was the only one hungry in the whole house. <laughs> and yes, if you're wondering, it took me till 7 or 8 o'clock at night to be able to be hungry. Luke 2, 8 through 20. That night in the fields near Bethlehem, some shepherds were guarding their sheep. 
All at once an angel came down from them to the Lord, and the brightness of the Lord's glory flashed around them. The shepherds were frightened, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, I have good news for you, which will make everyone happy. This very day, in King David's hometown, the Savior was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. You will know who he is, because you will find him dressed in baby clothes and lying on a bed of hay. Suddenly, many other angels came down from heaven and joined in praise of God. And they said, Praise God in heaven, peace on earth to everyone who pleases God. After the angels had left and went back to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see what the Lord has, has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph, and they saw the baby lying on the bed of hay. When the shepherds saw Jesus, they told his parents what the angels had said about him. Everyone listened and was surprised, but Mary kept thinking about all this and wondering what it meant. As the shepherds returned to their sheep, they were praising God and saying, Wonderful things about him. Everything that they had seen and heard was just as the angels had said. The star, the shepherds, and the angels. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I mean, you know, this, this whole day is just unbelievable. It's like a fairy tale, but it's not. It's God's story. It's the story of Jesus and what he did for us coming to be a man. And it's so exciting. I tell you, I love the CEB translation. I try to preach out of it so much, but it says in here, Mary kept thinking about all this and wondering what it meant, but I love the translation in the NIV, which it says that Mary kept these things in her heart and never forgot. And that's our memories. That's our memories. We, we keep things in our heart and we never forget. I've told you a lot of Christmas stories about my family today, and I could go on and on and on and tell you many more. I can tell you good stories. I can tell you bad stories. You know? But they all come out to make what life was about for all of us. And you know what's amazing is when the bad ones happen, it never made us not want to do Christmas again. You know that? We couldn't wait for that year. There's so many amazing stories in Christmas. And why do we have these amazing stories about Christmas in our life? Because it's a story that's never forgotten. The Christmas past that is the most, you know, it's amazing because one of the things that I'm really proud of as a Christian, very few Christians can repeat Luke 2, the Christmas story, word for word. I think they come pretty close. If it makes you feel better, I can't repeat it word for word. Only Linus can truly do it right. <laughs> but the thing is, is that we all remember it. Because it's the most important event in our life until the crucifixion and the resurrection. The Son of God comes to earth. And Mary remembered all these things and kept them in her heart. And that's what comes to us. Do we keep this in our heart? Do we keep Jesus in our heart? We see a lot of things. You know, a lot of shirts. I saw a guy the sweatshirt last night. Jesus is the reason for the city. Okay. And it's a nice church emotion. But do we show that everywhere we go? That Jesus is the reason for the season. It is why we have Christmas. It's why we have parties. It's why Tim Bones is playing the ukulele. <laughs> it is what Christmas is about. It's all about Jesus. It's why we eat turkey and ham, or Marianne's pizza. It's why we have cookies. It's why we do all these things. Because God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus. So that all who believed in him would never have to die. Because he would die for each one of us. Even though we're sinners and deserve punishment, he's perfect and never sinned. But he would do that for us. He came to learn what it was like to be a man. What it was like to live in this body. What it was like to go through hunger, thirst, sickness. He came to do all those things when he didn't have to. But he did it out of love. Do we remember that at Christmas? Is that what it's about? 
If you would like to today become a follower of Jesus and dedicate yourself to living his teachings and following what he wants to do and having that close relationship with him where you carry all these memories in his heart, in your heart, from his birth to his resurrection to when he taught us how to pray for things that we want over and over. To when he taught us to put people in front of ourselves and to love and pray for our enemies as much as we do our friends. All those things. We keep those things in our heart. If you want that as part of your